We're Hassani and Danielle Pettiford, and we're a real couple with real problems who almost called it quits. I was very frustrated. I became very disconnected, very um, jaded and, and cold. We have four children going on 20 years of marriage, and we practice what we preach. Our mission, to change the way couples relate to one another and teach them the skills needed to improve the quality of their relationships. This, this is, is the Couples, couples Academy, Academy Show. Show. Well, welcome everyone to the Couples Academy show. My name is Sasani. Good to have you with us. We are continuing our conversation on rebuilding trust in your marriage, right? Because this is what people are trying to figure out. How do we do this? And so we've been walking through some steps, giving you some techniques, some tips of what you can do to begin to restore it. And we want to continue in that conversation today. So listen, guys, we're here. We're live. We want you to share this with others. Make sure you like, share and subscribe. Um, if you're not connected to the YouTube channel, make sure you subscribe there. You get notifications. Some of you are watching on Facebook, Instagram, wherever that may be. We're glad to have you with us and just announce who you are, what city, state, and country you're calling from uh we just want to acknowledge you listen there's a lot coming up we are here in the summer in the thick of it we're excited about everything that's going to be happening last chance weekend is coming up yes 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 the last chance weekend is coming up the second weekend of july if you haven't registered it's not too late listen before we dive into today's topic take a close look at some of these announcements and we'll be right back and, and get into today's topic guys we're back we're talking about rebuilding trust through talk in touch um very specific in terms of what we're covering today because trust can be restored in a number of different ways obviously through talk we talk about this all the time communication is the most important um technique it's the most important skill it's the most important habit that you can develop in your relationship because you know when betrayal takes place of any kind uh it it, it causes a person to reevaluate who you really are what your true nature and character is and so of course 
there is that phase we call that the discovery phase when all types of questions come but that phase can last for quite some time and so we want to talk about how you begin to restore it you know one conversation at a time you know it makes me think of the fact that you know when questions do come there's this need to protect I want to protect you from the hurt and pain I want to protect you from what has happened because I don't want it to cause any more pain and in that process what happens is we become very guarded very guarded and we're very hyper cautious about how we answer certain questions and it's just like a person feels like they have to ask very like they have to ask a question eight different ways to get to the truth because while one person's mission is to get the truth the other person's mission is to deny certain truth that they think their spouse is not ready for so like a tactician they're very specific in how they answer and they know what to say they know what not to say they know how to be vague so that it doesn't give too much away they don't want to overshare they don't want to share what they think may set them back and so it becomes this tug of war between a couple and it becomes very problematic and, and and though this technique may work in a court of law it's disastrous for marriage now if you think about this in court when you're on the stand you practice with your attorney before you get on that stand specific ways to answer a question wait a minute whoa, whoa, whoa. you'd see that word you can't use that word because that implies such and such so it's all about how you respond, the choice words that you use, your facial expressions, your body language, your energy. You don't want to give the wrong impression as you are being interrogated. And so therefore, it, there's a skill to it. And, 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 and the goal is to get away with or to not reveal what they don't want to get out. And so oftentimes people use these phrases just like, you know what, I just, I don't remember. Um, I forgot. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, that was so long ago. You know, I don't recall. And, you know, I played this some time ago, maybe a year ago. But but oftentimes in these conversations, it feels as though the spouse, the hurt spouse is the attorney and you are on the stand and all of these questions are coming or may it may feel as if you know they are the officer and you're being interrogated downtown and all of these questions are coming and anything you say could be held against you so you're very careful what you say so you choose to say nothing and so in this particular clip i want to share with you it's an individual who's being uh, put on stand and being asked they're cross-examined by an attorney and asked specific questions and i'm not going to play the whole thing because the five minutes long but it gives you a point of, of what it is that i'm talking about uh just look at the response that he has to all of the questions that the attorney's asking check this out and you haven't attended college since 2005 as i understand it correct when in 2005 don't recall did you go to the spring semester i don't recall don't recall whether you went to the fall semester don't recall when did you produce your last movie i don't recall did you produce a movie in 2005? I don't recall. Did you produce a movie in 2004? I don't recall. No idea? No. What movies have you produced in the last three years? I don't recall. Have you produced one movie in the last three years? I don't remember. You don't remember whether that's you what produced I, a movie in the last three years? That's what I told you a couple seconds ago when you asked me. Yeah. I said I don't remember. You don't remember? No, the busy days, long hours. Uh -huh. It affects remembering everything. Affects your memory. Correct. Could you show? <laughs> do, do you see what I'm talking about? And, and it's interesting because some of us have had the same exact experience with our spouse, and this is exactly how we feel. I'm trying to get information out. I'm trying to draw a conclusion. I'm trying to connect dots so that I can make sense of this. And every time I ask you a question, I don't recall. I don't remember. It was long ago. My mind wasn't there. And oftentimes it is a form of manipulation. Now, keep in mind, there are things that a person just doesn't remember. That, that is a fact. But when it is to this degree, 
obviously this is an example of a person that is very guarded and they're not they're not willing to share and so that level of vulnerability that level of you know just being honest and having intimate conversation is not there and what it does is it cr it literally implodes uh your ability to uh have trust built in that relationship and so as we said on yesterday this whole say, this whole saying listen just trust me i'm different now i've changed i'm a new me well it has to be demonstrated through actions and behaviors and one of the ways to do that is by having what we call courageous conversations when we're willing to go into certain areas that may seem uncomfortable for the truth to come out because keep in mind you have to understand particularly when there's been a betrayal if a spouse was unfaithful in a marriage that is not just that spouse's history it's a part of the marriage history if it's a part of the marriage history then it's also a part of the history of the uh, betrayed spouse and so now a part of their own history is unclear it's blurred uh i you know is think about not knowing your history think about if you didn't know who your parents were if you didn't know where you came from if you didn't know certain things that happened in your childhood like the, the like you had no clue it would not allow you to fully be able to embrace life in its totality because there's missing pieces of your puzzle that have just not been revealed and we've known many people who have think about not knowing who your parent is right we've known people who felt like man I didn't meet my my parent till I was like 45 years old and I felt like a piece of me was missing but now 45 years later after being a grown adult and I had a chance to meet my father or my mother now I'm able to understand myself on a deeper level now likewise when it comes to any aspect of your history even though it was your spouse who was engaged in the affair you not having that information keeps you from having a full understanding of your history or at least your history with your spouse and so these conversations are critically important if we're going to be able to move forward and build something that's long lasting and sustainable a couple questions that are coming in um uh, here we go. What if your spouse is not easy to talk to? Most convos don't end well, especially when the convos are difficult, right? Well, that's the thing. Difficult conversations are hard to have. And some people live life by avoidance. And some people don't know how to preface certain conversations. And really, that leads to the next point, right? I think it's important that couples need to learn what effective communication looks like, to have clear expectations, to have rules of engagement, to make sure that you both are getting something out of this situation. And it kind of leads to the next point. So, we, you know, the first point is we're, we're Ultimately, what we're saying is you, you have to learn how to avoid being guarded, because as long as you have your guard up, your defenses up, a wall up, I can't see beyond the wall. I can't see on the other side of that wall. And so what happens is when there's a breach of, of communication and a breach of trust in a relationship, a wall has been constructed. But that wall has to come down and a window has to be constructed. A window allows me to see into the life into the heart, into the mind of the other person. Now, if we're going to go in that direction, step number two, we're talking about rebuilding trust through talk and touch. One of the techniques of how to effectively talk and communicate with your spouse is to engage in what we would call spousal selected monologues. Now, if you've been to a last chance weekend, a private marriage intensive, we take uh, monologues very seriously and there's many many ways to engage in a monologue but as it relates to a spousal monologue it's important to say listen there's certain things that I want to talk about and, and, and really to be honest with you if you want to have difficult courageous conversations with your spouse that you feel like they're not ready for or they just don't do well in what you want to do is get in the mode and get in the practice of just communicating get them communicating about things that aren't difficult that aren't hard because what you're doing is you're working a muscle and the more you work that muscle you it's just like going to the gym i'm starting out with you know just the bar bench pressing just that bar once i get comfortable with that let me throw five pounds on each side 
side. And so that's the same approach that you want to take to conversations with your spouse, particularly when they're difficult to have. And so if we step away from, see, the betrayal topics, the affair topics, whatever violation may have taken place, because there's an uneasiness to talk about those things and go in the other direction, what type of conversations can we begin to have? Now, when you're having a spousal monologue, a monologue is a one way transactional conversation. It is not a dialogue where I talk to you and you talk to me. Sometimes we have to allow our spouse to speak to us uninterrupted. And that's one of the challenges when we communicate, because when our spouse finally does open up, all we do is we step on every word they say. We're constantly cutting them off. We're constantly, you know, over talking them, telling them why they, what they're saying doesn't make any sense. And all it does is shut them down. And so if you want a spouse who finds it difficult to talk with you in the first place to talk, you have to create space uninterrupted for them to share what it is that they have to share. Does that make sense? And rather Rather than talking to them at the wrong time, they're in the middle of watching a game or they're in the middle of work or they're doing something. And because you have a need to talk, we need to talk now. See, see how we come across the wrong way. See, it's not just about what we're doing. It's about how we do what we do. If I'm up, you're going to be up. It's three o'clock in the morning. We need to talk because I want to talk. I don't care that you're at work. We need to talk now. You care more about your customers. You care more about your boss and your coworkers than you do me. Well, I have a need to do it. now, And so we're showing up the wrong way and then wonder why our spouse is not communicating with us. So we got to look at ourselves, too. We got to look at how we show up to make sure that we're setting the stage and creating a safe environment for them to engage. And so when it comes to having these monologues, you want to preface the conversation and say, hey, babe, listen, uh, how about tomorrow when you get off of work? we have a conversation. See, see how we're giving advance notice about something that we want to discuss? And so when it comes to advance notice, I have time to think, I have time to process, I have time to get my thoughts together, just to get in a space of, hmm, how do I want to broach this topic so that I can give my spouse all of what they need? But as I said, what type of conversation should we be having in these spousal monologues to get us started in the process. Well, uh, let me put a few up on the screen, right? Now, these are non-betrayal related, but it allows you to get an understanding of who your spouse is. So, these spousal selected monologues. Well, what about the spousal's relationship with his or her parents, right? A lot of times couples do not talk about their past, their childhood, their relationship with their parents. We know that the relationship is strained, but we don't know why. Let's give our spouse an opportunity to share what what happened. What was the relationship like? Or if it was a phenomenal relationship, I just want to hear your heart. Tell me about your relationship with your mom, with your dad. Or, or, Or what about the spousal's attitude towards money, work, or spiritual issues, right? Now, we're doing life together. We're not just companions in a relationship. We're partners in a marriage. And so oftentimes there's been a big disconnect. We haven't been in alignment when it comes to certain things. So what are your thoughts? What's your heart? What's your belief? What's your philosophy when it comes to work? You know, when it comes to money, money has always been a very sensitive issue. And we've always found ourselves at odds and fighting and and going back and forth over finances. I just want to hear your heart on that. You know, what about spiritual issues? You know, there was a time when we used to go to church or we used to be more engaged. We would read and pray together. We would do all types of things. And there's been such a huge disconnect. Tell me, tell me your heart on the issue of, of spirituality. Where do you stand on that? And, and the reason why these conversations are important is because when we don't talk, we make certain assumptions about our spouse. We think we know what they feel, what they believe, because we're observing them from a distance. We're not engaging in conversation to get further clarity and understanding. And oftentimes what we think is true may not be true at all. Okay. Uh, How about the spouses? You know, what is your one or five or 10 year plan or dream for your future. We used to hope, we used to dream, we used to talk about what life would be like in the future, but we don't do this anymore because all we're focused on is the past, right? And because we're focused on the past, we look at the future through the lenses of our past, or at least I do. So it's hard for me to even believe that there is a future for us, but maybe you have a future that I'm not even privy to. Maybe there's something you're hoping for that I'm not even aware of. Tell me, what's your one-year goal? 
What's your five-year plan? What's your 10-year vision and dream? Share. Give me life. Let's begin to resuscitate this relationship by planning for a future that we could have together. How about, how do you feel about, how do you feel that you've changed as a result of this experience? Like, we've been through hardship. We've been through hell. It's been a very difficult season in our relationship. But, but <clears throat> how have you changed? How have you changed spiritually? How have you changed emotionally? How have you changed physically? You know, how have you changed intellectually? Some of these changes could be good changes. Some of these changes could have been bad changes, right? Because of all the stress and the pressure and what we've gone through in our relationship. I've lost weight. I've gained weight. You know, uh, I don't feel secure in my job or I've zoned in and disconnected from you and I am secure in my job. You know, spiritually, I just feel like I'm all over the place or maybe it's caused me to lean further into my relationship with God, you know, because of the crisis we're in. Where, where are you? It's kind of, let's do a self assessment. Let, wh wh where are you in these spaces? Because I want to know what's going on on the inside of you. And I want to know what I can believe in. Because if you haven't changed, and if you're still the same person that you've always been, what hope does that give me? Right? And so that's a conversation you may need some time to really think about. So giving your spouse 24 hours notice, it's helpful for them to put their thoughts together and then to begin to share. Another one, what does our marriage look like a year from today? Right? This is what we will call for some people the impossible game. Because if you're in a bad place, some people really struggle to see that there'll be anything different. We've been in this same rut for the last year. I don't know what another year would, would do to make a difference. So I don't know. I think we're going to be in the same place. Or, you know what? I believe that we're going to be in a much better place. We're digging ourselves out of this ditch and we're going to make a quantum leap forward. It's like it's important to know where your spouse is, you know? Sometimes your spouse needs to be encouraged and motivated. Some, sometimes your spouse has all the encouragement and motivation to then give you. But having these conversations about non-betrayal or non-violation issues and topics helps you even to deal with the betrayal a little bit better because you're getting to the heart of who your spouse is. Now, here's the deal. This is not just your spouse having to answer questions and share their heart, but it is also your responsibility to do the same. So you're taking turns. So maybe on Monday night during our work day, listen, babe, this is what I want to talk about. I want to hear from you uninterrupted. You're just going to be talking. I'm going to be silent. I'm going to be, you know, actively listening, taking notes, but I'm not interrupting. And then I want to have an opportunity to share my thoughts on the same topic. So, so that way you're really, and record the conversation so you can listen to it later, get more insight. These are the things that will begin to help you rebuild trust because there's a glimpse of hope that you may see in the present and the future based upon these conversations. I'm going to tell you something. When couples come to the last chance weekend, I hear it all the time. Oh my God, I thought I knew what my spouse was feeling. I thought it was over. I had such a dim look you know, in perspective about what was possible, but coming here and being able to have real conversations and able to get clarity and understanding, I feel like I'm in such a better place and thank God for this experience. Well, this is what happens when we engage in monologues, but these are the monologues that you can engage in as well. So if you haven't done these things, do these things because they will help in the trust building process. Listen, guys, you're watching the Couples Academy show. Got another powerful technique, but stay tuned. Watch this and we'll be right back. My name is Steven. I'm from New York. And coming here, I didn't know what to think. Uh, a lot of nervousness on the plane, a lot of nervousness the night before. I talked to a lot of friends and they said that uh, types of therapy like this are raw. They're rough. It's really going to wring you out emotionally. But uh, Hassani calls this an intensive. An intense is such a better word. Uh, they really put you in a place here where you can open up emotionally. They help you to open up emotionally. Uh, right from day one, it goes deep. It's tough, but they're there for you. And then it's a beautiful place to be. So after you put all this exhausting emotional work in, you have a nice place to relax. It's a beautiful property. They make sure that you have a place where you and your spouse can really uh, connect after doing all this work because it would you don't want to wait until you're back home to feel comfortable with uh, your spouse again to really use this work. And so I feel like through the whole thing, yeah, it's been exhausting. 
it's been difficult, but it's been exactly what I've needed. It's been achievable because of the, the uh, surroundings, because of the people, uh, wonderful people that helped out. They took care of all of our needs and literally I've taken so many tools uh, with me that I can bring home to improve my relationship and I've learned so much about myself. It's not just about improving yourself. I've learned or improving your relationship. I've learned how to improve myself uh, to improve my relationship and through all the days that we've been here um, there's been a a real sense of accomplishment with each thing that we've done and I go uh, go into the future with hope because of this intensive. What an amazing, what an amazing, what an amazing testimonial from this couple. Um, they came to a last chance weekend and really were going through like many couples do. And since then, they've been able to restore their their relationship. They have a beautiful baby. They're still working towards the reconciliation uh, and healing process that they started here in the intensive, but just so happy for where they are today. And uh, we share these things to give you hope and encouragement that if others have gone through and are making it, you can make it as well. Let me go to some of these comments that came through. Uh, Marilyn says, when I ask a question of my spouse, uh, he gets defensive. It makes me feel like he's hiding something. Yeah. And, you know, th th this is a challenge. Right. And so one of the things that we uh, try to encourage spouses to embrace is total transparency, openness and honesty. The, the, the fact is some people are I won't say wired, but but in essence, they lean towards a very private disposition. They're very private about things like they, they're not used to talking you know, they have more internal conversations with themselves. They only say what needs to be said when it needs to be said. And it doesn't allow for connection. It, it may, you know, it's like there's a difference between bonding and connecting. When you're bonding with someone, it doesn't require a lot of conversation. It, it requires more recreational companionship, being in the same space, doing the same thing. But connection requires conversation. And so what we need to do is truly embrace our work days, and even our non-work days when we're just having general conversation, and ask, why does it seem like you get so defensive? What, 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 is there something that you don't want to share? Ah, just, just, what do we need to talk about? Be, be, because we're living life together. I want to know you. I want to know your heart. I want to know your intentions. I want to know your motives. And so, yeah, I can understand how it can make you feel some type of way if they're being defensive. It compromises one's ability to trust. And if you have a desire to win your heart, your wife's heart back or your husband's heart back and to get them to believe in you again, share your heart, be real. And if there's things that you're still hiding and, and things that, you know, you're operating in a clandestine manner, maybe there's some areas of growth that you need to embrace. And this is why we encourage Unearth and Foundry, because we get to the heart of the matter. We get to the core essence of who we as human beings are, and we begin to rebuild if you will, who we are from the inside out, our character, our integrity, you know, um, the truth that we need to stand on. Because unfortunately, most of us have been raised and trained and enculturated and indoctrinated in a society to lie, to tell half truths, to give a false impression. And we're doing it for all types of reasons. And so sometimes we can't even recognize ourselves. We don't even know who we are anymore because we've been caught up in a lie for so long. So defensiveness, as we stated in the first step, does does not work when you're trying to build intimacy and regain trust in a relationship because it doesn't allow your spouse to feel safe. All right, next question. How do you establish boundaries while trying to stay connected when your spouse chooses to do things that continue to break trust instead of rebuild? The boundaries that need to be established have to be established by the two of you. It cannot be a boundary that you establish and you hand over to him or he creates and he shifts over to you. It's got to be something that authentically comes from the two of you because if it comes from the two of you, then that means that, wow, this is what we believe. We feel good about this, you're following what we call the policy of joint agreement. And the policy of joint agreement says that we both have an enthusiastic agreement and belief and excitement about what this new boundary or rule is. But if we both, if our hearts aren't in it, and we're just 
going through with it. We're going along to get along. We're just accommodating. We're constantly having to motivate, to encourage, to remind our spouse of what they agreed to because they just said something just to move on. And, and boundaries are critically important, even in marriage. There's a phenomenal book called Boundaries in Marriage. I would encourage that you get that. And it talks about how to establish something uh, so that your marriage can be lifelong and sustainable. And so boundaries are critically important. We've been talking about that for quite some time. The fact that I have to create a boundary uh, to protect our marriage, why should I have to do all that? Because sometimes it's just necessary. When your marriage has gone off course and you're trying to get it back on course, boundaries and parameters or rules, if you will, or codes of conduct that you both subscribe to will help you to regain the trust that you're seeking in a relationship. All right, let's go to the next point, right? We talked about avoid being guarded. That's number one. Then we talked about how we should have spousal selected monologues. That's number two. The next thing is gain trust through touch. Now, um, we've said this before, that there are three components to effective communication. Your words, what you say, which is 7% of your communication. Your tonality, how you say what you say, which is 23% of your communication. And then your nonverbal communication, which is facial expressions, body language, gestures, touch, 70% of your communication. Now, one of the biggest issues that couples struggle with is this whole idea of, you know, introducing sex back into the relationship because I'm not feeling you, I'm not feeling this, I don't feel comfortable, you want me to give you my body when you won't even give me your heart, like, there's a lot going on. And so what we say is, all right, Maybe you want to restore your relationship through touch. Now, this maybe we delve into this tomorrow because there's really a lot of a lot that goes into this. You know, how do we go from there was a violation here to fully giving of myself in this relationship in a physical way? There's a process, and I want to take the time and not just give you a bullet point into what that looks like. So I promise you, if you tune in tomorrow. I'm going to walk you through the power of touch, non-sexual touch, and how that can be used as one of the methods to restore trust in a relationship. You've been watching the Couples Academy show. Hope you got something out of it. I will see you in the morning for another episode. Until then, listen, tonight, tonight, don't forget, tonight, we have who? We have Walter and Charmaine. Uh, they are doing Before I Do. Uh, so listen, if you want to know how to build a healthy foundation for your existing relationship, Relationship, make sure you tune in tonight at 9 p.m. But until then, we'll see you tomorrow. Love you guys. Take care.